Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So this is the fifth uh, reminder, the fifth reminder uh, on the fifth day of Ramadan 1443. And so this is a, a series on uh, short reminders on Tawheed. And in the previous four lessons, just to recap what we've covered so far, uh, in the first reminder on the first day, we looked at uh, uh, a number of things. First of all, uh, the most excellence type of knowledge is the knowledge of Tawheed. And the excellence and nobility of a knowledge is related to the excellence and the nobility and the greatness of the subject matter. And so since the subject matter is Allah Azza wa Jal, who is uh, the greatest and the mightiest, then obviously that knowledge is the most noble and the most superior type of knowledge. And then we looked at the meaning of Tawheed. We mentioned the, the definition, Ifradullahi Azza wa Jal bima yakhtasso bihi fi uluhiyatihi wa rububiyatihi wa asma'ihi wa sifatihi. And so we explained that uh, definition and then we mentioned numerous evidences from the Qur'an and the Sunnah for this particular meaning and the fact that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu he actually used this uh, word, you know, the verb wahada, wahada, an yuwahidullah, an yuwahidullah ta'ala, uh, an yuwahidullah, he used these words. He even used the word at tawheed in kana aqarra bit tawheed he said in one hadith so these words were clearly used by the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we mentioned some evidences from the quran and the sunnah in the second lesson we looked at the categories of tawheed and we explained that these categories are not an innovation they are not a bid'ah they are not derived through reason they are not a matter of opinion, rather this is something that is very clear and explicit and evident in the Qur'an itself. And we mentioned some statements from Sheikh Ibn Baz, Rahimahullah, and Sheikh Al-Fawzan, and Sheikh Al-Shanqiti, you know, explaining that these categories have come by way of Al-Istiqra, Al-Istiqra, which means that upon a comprehensive, detailed survey and analysis of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, it becomes evident that Tawheed has three aspects to it. And then in the third lesson, we looked at evidences for that, more evidences. We looked at uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah An-Nas, the first and the last chapters of the Qur'an, and likewise, there are many evidences in between where the three aspects are very, very clear and very, very apparent. So this was, this was in the third lesson. And we, then we started looking at the relationship between each of the three categories of Tawheed. And we said that there are three types of relationship. The first is Al-Istilzam, al Al-Istilzam, al where one thing necessitates another thing. And so this is the relationship between Tawheed al-Rububiyyah with Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah necessitates Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. The second type of relationship is Tadammun, Tadammun al-Tadammun, which means inclusion or to contain or to comprise. So this means that when we have Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, which is the Tawheed of singling out Allah in worship, then that obviously includes and comprises a person singling out Allah in his rububiyyah, in his lordship. So Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, its relationship to Tawheed al-Rububiyyah is by way of tadammun, tadammun, by way of inclusion. And the third type of relationship is a shumul which is when something uh, includes comprehensively all the other things. And this is Tawheed al-Asma'i wa-Sifat. 
uh, when we speak of Tawheed al asmai wa Sifat and all the various names of Allah, some of those names relate to Allah's Rububiyyah, you know, His actions of creating and providing and giving life and taking life. You know, Ar Razaq, Al Muhi, Al Mumid, Al Khaliq, Al Mudabbir, and so on and so forth. Then they relate to Allah's Rububiyyah. And then there are other names uh, Al Ghafoor, Al Rahim, Al Tawwab. Al Quddus, Al Azim, Al Kabir, Al Muta'al, and they all mention the greatness of Allah, the grandeur of Allah, the fact that Allah accepts repentance from His servants, that He forgives His servants, that He shows mercy to His servants. All of this relates to um, what, what the hearts and the limbs perform of the worship of Allah. And so, Therefore, al asmai wa sifat, the names and the attributes, uh, they indicate both al rububiya and al uluhiya right? So the relationship between Tawheed al asmai wa sifat to the other two categories is by way of al-shumul, by way of comprehensively including them. Then we, in the last lesson yesterday, we looked at some speech from Shaykh al-Fawzan, Hafidhahullah ta'ala, and he outlined and explained uh, these, these issues in a bit more detail, the relationship between al rububiya and al uluhiya So this brings us to today's reminder. Uh, this is the uh, fifth uh, reminder on Tawheed. And in today's lesson, what we're going to do is look at some differences between Tawheed al uluhiya and Tawheed al rububiya from maybe five or six different angles. These are just some subtle differences or some, some differences that we need to be aware of uh, to, to help us understand the issue more clearly. And once we've looked at these differences, we will finish inshallah by two citations, one from Imam al-Tahawi, rahimahullah, and one from Ibn Batta al-Uqbari. And they are two scholars uh, both of whom were present in the 4th century after Hijra. So as for the differences, what is the difference between Tawheed al uluhiyah and Tawheed al rububiyah We can look at this from a number of different angles. The first one is purely from the linguistic meaning of the word Rabb and Ilah. Rabb and Ilah. So this is really a linguistic uh, difference. So Al-Ilah, Al-Ilah means Al-Ma'luh, Al-Ma'bud, Al-Ladhi Yastahiqu Al-Ibadah. Al-Ma'luh, Al-Ma'bud, Al-Ladhi Yastahiqu Al-Ibadah. So the meaning of Ilah is the one who is worshipped, the one who is adored, who is worshipped, who deserves worship. Right, so this is the meaning of ilah, ilah, the one who is adored, venerated, worshipped, and who deserves to be worshipped. So this is al ilah, which is Allah. And as for the word rabb, rabb, the word rabb, it means maliku shay, maliku shay, one who owns something. وَصَاحِبُهُ وَالسَّيِّدْ الْمُطَاعِ Right, the one who owns something and the one who is obeyed, the one who is obeyed and who is al-muslih lishay, the one who rectifies another thing, al-mudabbir lahu, al-mudabbir lahu, who controls it, who oversees it, who regulates it, al-qa'imu ala tarbiyatihi, and the one who looks after it and nurtures it, right? So this is, these are the meanings of the word Rabb, Rabb. And when we add the definite article to this, Ar-Rabb, Ar-Rabb, then this refers only to Allah Azza wa Jal, only to Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is the first difference purely from the meaning of the word Ilah, Al-Ilah, and the word Ar-Rabb. The second way that we can look at the difference between Tawheed Ar-Rububiyyah 
and Tawheed al uluhiyah is in terms of actions, action. Because one of them relates to the action of Allah Zawajal and the other relates to the action of the servant. Right, so Tawheed al rububiyyah this refers or relates to the actions of Allah Zawajal. And so the Tawheed here is that when we look at the actions of Allah Zawajal, those that we mentioned, creating, providing, sustaining, owning, regulating, and all the other things, then they are singled out for Allah. These actions are unique and specific, and Allah is singled out with respect to these actions which he does. No one shares with him in these actions. So this is the Tawheed of Allah bi'af'alihi. Bi'af'alihi. This is singling out Allah with these actions. And so this Tawheed, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, relates to the actions of Allah Azawajal. As for Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, then this relates to the actions of the servants. The actions of the servants. So here what the servants do, they take the, the various actions of, of ibadah, prayer, charity, fasting, hajj, and likewise uh, the actions of the heart, fear, love, hope, reliance, and so on and so forth. They are singled out and directed only to Allah Azawajal. So this is something that the servant does. The servant directs and makes his actions purely and sincerely for Allah alone. So Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah or Tawheed al-Ibadah, this relates to the actions of the servants. We are speaking here of the actions of the servants. And Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, we are speaking here of the actions of Allah Azza wa Jal. They are, you know, he, he is singled out in those actions. So this is the difference from the point of view from the angle of action, right? Actions. Actions of Allah relate to Rububiyyah. Actions of the servants relate to al uluhiyya So this now is a second way we can look at the difference between Rububiyyah and uluhiyya. A third way is to look at it from the angle of affirmation and rejection. Affirmation and rejection. Right, which which of the two is affirmed, which of the two is rejected, right? So, the difference between Tawheed al rububiyyah and Tawheed al uluhiyah is that Tawheed al rububiyyah is pretty much affirmed by all of the people of the earth, all of the mushrikun generally, and it's only kind of rejected by a very small number of people, uh, like, like Fir'aun and you know the the the, the atheists uh, but but this is this rejection on their behalf is really only out of arrogance and pride whereas inwardly deep down inwardly they know for sure and they are convinced that this creation and all of the wisdoms therein and all of the asbab the ways and means and how everything connects together and how everything is suited for life, and how there are so many wisdoms and lofty objectives and means and ends, all of which are present, which we can see very clearly in ourselves, in what is around us, in, in, in the heavens, right? They know, they are convinced inwardly, they know that you know there is something behind this, but it is purely arrogance and pride that makes them reject that there is a rub, you know. Uh, for this creation. So, Tawheed al rububiyyah is, is from the fitrah and it's acknowledged by most of the people of the earth. So there is no dispute about this. This is, this is acknowledged. And that's why we see in the Quran from the verses that we mentioned previously, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَكُولُنَّ اللَّهِ That if you were to ask the pagans, the pagan Arabs, who created the heavens and the earth, they will surely say Allah. So as it relates to Tawheed ar rububiyyah then Tawheed ar rububiyyah is acknowledged 
and it is admitted and it is affirmed. In contrast, however, Tawheed al uluhiyya then this is what has been rejected and uh, denied. It wasn't uh, accepted by the mushrikun. Uh, they rejected it. And this is why when the Messenger of Allah when he said to those people, Qulu la ilaha illallah. He said to them, say, there is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah. What did they say? They said, as is mentioned in the Quran, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ They said, as Allah mentions from them, has he made all of the gods into a single god? Indeed, this is a strange thing. This is a strange thing. And that's because they knew full well the meaning of La ilaha illallah. They knew exactly what it meant and they knew exactly what it required of them. It required of them to abandon the worship they were giving to all these other deities besides Allah, whether it be the angels or the jinn or righteous pious men or idols or the trees or whatever it might be, to shun and abandon the worship of all those things and to worship only Allah alone. But they refused this because of various reasons. There were various reasons why they didn't want to do this. You know, some of those reasons relate to uh, pride and honor. They didn't want to abandon the way of their forefathers. Other reasons were, um, you know, out of, uh, you know, out, out, out of uh, the intense love and attachment they had to their deities that they were worshipping, many, many different reasons. So this now is a third difference when we look at Ar-Rububiyyah and Uluhiyyah from the angle of acceptance and rejection. Rububiyyah is accepted, Uluhiyyah is, was rejected by the, the pagans and the polytheists. Also similar to this, this is the next difference is kind of is, is connected, which is Entrance into Islam, right? So which of the two categories enters you into Islam and which of the two categories wouldn't really make a difference, right? This is, this is another difference. So as we know very clearly, Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah is what enters you into Islam. Whoever affirms it and actualizes it, then he enters into Islam uh, because, you know, uh, this requires him to shun and abandon the worship of all things besides Allah Azawajal. And this is the meaning of Al-Uluhiyya. So this is the one that enters a person into Islam. As for Tawheed al rububiyyah then this would not enter him into Islam uh, because as we've seen clearly, the very first polytheists, they used to affirm that Allah is the Rabb, the Lord, the giver of life, the taker of life, the Lord of the mighty throne, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and they affirmed all of these affairs for Allah uh, but they rejected his uluhiyyah. So that did not enter them into uh, Islam. right? So that's another difference, a fourth difference between ar and uluhiyyah. One does not enter you into Islam and the other one does. Another difference is, is to do with the relationship either with the creation or with the legislation, right? So what we mean here is that Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, its connection is to the signs that we see in the creation, right? The ayat, these are the ayat, ayat kawniyya, the signs that we see uh, in the creation around us. So Tawheed al rububiyyah is to do with the ayat which are observed, which are witnessed, which are experienced, and these are the ayat kawniya, right? So this is what we see around us, the sun, the moon, the stars, the wind, the rain, the trees, the animals, our own souls, uh, you know, the fact that you know we, we are born, uh, we are not present, and then then we are born. We we you know all these kind of ayat that we see around us, the ayat kauniya, 
then Tawheed al rububiyyah relates to that. And these signs, what do they affirm? What do they establish? They establish that uh, Allah created and he brought into existence and he determined and decreed everything. Right? This is what these ayat, what they point to. So Tawheed al rububiyyah its relationship is with the ayat kawniyyah. The signs which are created, which are observed, which are witnessed, which are experienced. As for Tawheed al uluhiyyah then it is connected to the ayat, the verses which are diniyyah, shari'iyyah, right, which are legislated to do with the religion, right, meaning the verses that Allah reveals which establish his command and his prohib prohibition and his promise, right? So this means uh, the ayat which are revealed, which for example, command us to pray, to fast, to give in charity, and to, you know, to be righteous, to be good to, to, to parents, and to, you know, all those other things. These ayat, they, they, they direct and command these things, and they prohibit, you know, shirk, and they prohibit, um, you know, disobedience, and they prohibit so many other things. So, Tawheed al uluhiyya what is it connected to? It is connected to the ayat which are revealed, which are legislated. Whereas Tawheed al rububiyyah is related, you know, its connection is to the ayat which are kawniyya. Also, from another angle, um, uh, we, we mentioned this previously, Tawheed al uluhiyya is connected to amal, to action, and Tawheed al rububiyyah is connected to ilm, which is knowledge. Tawheed al rububiyyah is connected to knowledge, and Tawheed al uluhiyyah is connected to is connected to um, action. So we mentioned this previously. So these are some of the um, kind of differences uh, between Tawheed al rububiyyah and Tawheed al uluhiyyah uh, we can mention one more, which is that, uh, you know, what, what was the point of contention? What was the point of difference between the messengers and the people to whom they were sent? The point of difference was Tawheed al uluhiyya not Tawheed al rububiyya So rububiyya was not a point of contention. So these are six or seven um, differences between Tawheed al rububiyya and Tawheed al uluhiyya some of them overlap others, uh, but it's six or seven different ways from which to look at the difference. So once we've concluded uh, th those differences, we now want to finish our discussion by just mentioning one or two statements from some of the early Imams uh, from, from the era of the Salaf or shortly thereafter. And the purpose behind this is to prove that this understanding of Tawheed is not a bid'ah, it's not an innovation of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymi rahimahullah, nor is it an innovation of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala, and nor is it an innovation of the contemporary scholars. Rather we find that this understanding of Tawheed, because it is obviously from, from the Qur'an, we find that the Salaf, they clearly spoke of this. and. Although there are many, 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 many statements that can be brought, you know, from the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Tabi Tabi'een, you know, and their commentary upon the Qur'an, uh, we want to mention just one or two statements which are very, very clear and very, very uh, apparent. And so the first statement here is from Ibn Batta, Ibn Batta al-Uqbari, rahimahullah ta'ala, and he is a great scholar from the fourth century uh, of Islam after Hijrah. And he is the author of the book Al Ibanatul Kubra. Al Ibanatul Kubra. It is one of the great and tremendous uh, books on creed, in which uh, the Sheikh, Sheikh, uh, you know, the, the, the scholar Ibn Batta, he gathered together uh, evidences and statements from the Salaf uh, and texts on different subjects of creed, on on Iman, Al Qadr, the attributes, the sifat, and you know, so on and so forth. And so he said within this book, and look at how uh, very clearly he, he has outlined 
the three aspects of Tawheed, right? And this is literally 1,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, many, many centuries before Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah and, and many, many centuries before Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. So he says, Aslu al-Imani billah alladhi yajibu ala al-khalqi i'tiqaduhu fi ithbat al-Iman so he says, first of all, the foundation of Iman in Allah, which is obligatory upon the creation to believe in affirmation of Iman, is three things. In affirmation of their Iman in Allah is three things. So meaning that the foundation of Iman without which there cannot be Iman in Allah, then it is by three things. What are those three things? He says, أَحَدُهَا The first of them, أَنْ يَأْتَقِدَ الْعَبْدُ رَبَّانِيَّتَهُ That a servant believes in the رَبَّانِيَّ of of Allah. Rabbaniya is just another word for rububiya, that the servant believes in the Rabbaniya of Allah. لِيَكُونَ بِذَلِكْ مُبَاينًا مِنْ أَهْلِ التَّعْطِيلِ أَلَّذِي لَا يُثْبِتُونَ صَانِعًا Right, so that he may be different and distinct from the people of rejection, meaning the people of atheism, who do not believe in a maker or a creator, right? So this is the first aspect of Iman in Allah, that you affirm the Rabbaniyyah of Allah, meaning the Rububiyyah of Allah. And by this we separate ourselves from the people of negation and atheism who do not affirm a maker, right? So this is the first thing. Clearly, this is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. Then he says, Ibn Battah rahimullah, وَالثَّانِي أَنْ يَأْتَقِدَ, أن يأتقد Wahdaniyatahu, Wahdaniyatahu, that he believes in his Wahdaniyya, in his oneness and his uniqueness. And what does he mean by this? He says, لِيَكُونَ مُبَايِنًا بِذَلِكَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الشِّرْكِ أَلَّذِينَ أَقَرُّوا بِالسَّانِعِ وَأَشْرَكُوا مَعَهُ فِي الْعِبَادَةِ غَيْرَهُ So he says that he believes in the Wahdaniyya of Allah, so that he can be different and distinct from the people of shirk who affirm a maker, who affirm a, a maker and a creator, but who then associate partners with him in worship. So this now is very clearly and explicitly, this is the Wahid al-Uluhiyyah. Very clearly, Ibn Batta has mentioned this. And then thirdly, he says, وَالثَّالِثْ أَنْ يَأْتَقِدَهُ مَوْسُوفًا بِالصِّفَاتِ الَّتِي لَا يَجُوزُ إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ مَوْسُوفًا بِهِ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ وَالْقُدْرَةِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَالسَّائِرِ مَا وَصَفَ بِهِ نَفْسَهُ فِي كِتَابِهِ So he says, and the third, meaning the third aspect of Iman in Allah, is to believe that he is described with attributes which... Uh, uh, which, which, which only he is uh, described of, you know, which is not possible except that he should be described with them, such as knowledge and power and wisdom and all of the other things which he described himself with in his book. And this clearly is Tawheed al Asma'i wa Sifat. Right? So, this is a statement from Ibn Battah. Al-Uqbari, rahimahullah ta'ala, a scholar from, you know, a thousand years ago, who is speaking of the three aspects of Tawheed. And finally, we'll finish just with one more statement with Imam Al-Tahawi, rahimahullah. And he said at the beginning of his creed, Al-Tahawiyyah, he said, Naqulu fi tawheed illahi mu'taqideena bi tawfiq illahi anna allaha wahidun la sharika lahu wa la shay'un مثله ولا شيء يعجزه ولا إله غير غيره. So he said, we say regarding the Tawheed of Allah, believing by Allah's 
tawfiq, that Allah is one without any partner. There is nothing like him. There is nothing that, 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 that makes, the, the, there's nothing that renders him incapable. There's nothing that can escape him. And nor is there any deity besides him. So in these simple statements, At-Tahawi rahimahullah has mentioned the three aspects of Tawheed. So when he said, Annallaha wahidun la sharika lahu. This is a general statement in which all the aspects of Tawheed are included. Annallaha wahid la sharika lahu. Then he said, Wala shay'un mithluhu. There is nothing which is a likeness of him. This is Tawheed of Al-Asma'i wa Sifat. This is the Tawheed of Al-Asma'i wa Sifat. Allah's names and attributes. Because there is nothing which is a likeness to him in his names and his attributes. Then he said, وَلَا شَيْءٌ يُعْجِزُهُ There is nothing which can, you know, which escapes him or which renders him incapable. Which means Allah has power over all of his creation. Right? So this is Tawheed ar rububiyyah and then finally he said, وَلَا إِلَهٌ غَيْرُهُ And there's no deity besides him. There's no deity other than him, besides him. So this clearly is Tawheed al uluhiya So here we have two statements from two great scholars in the 4th century. Uh, just by way of example, uh, there are many others that we can bring from even earlier than that uh, to show that this understanding of Tawheed is not innovated Rather, it is what is mentioned and necessitated in the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the evidences for that are very overwhelming and uh, numerous. So with that, we'll conclude our reminder uh, for today. And so today was just looking at some of the differences between ar and Uluhiyyah. And then finally, uh, finishing the whole affair by mentioning some statements from uh, uh, the early scholars who established uh, the presence of this understanding and these different aspects of Tawheed. So we'll end uh, today's lesson. Tomorrow's lesson, inshallah, we'll be looking at, you know, uh, some of the reasons why it is uh, the, uh, uh, of the obligation to be concerned with Tawheed. The obligation to be concerned with Tawheed, some of the evidences that obligate upon us to, to show concern and to be uh, concerned with uh, the matter of Tawheed. So with that, we'll conclude today's lesson. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.